Um, I want to welcome everybody tonight. Um, my name is Carrie Hewitt. I'm currently the interim dean of the School of Graduate Studies, and I'm really glad to see all of you here tonight and um, such a wonderful topic that we're going to be talking a little bit about. Uh, so I'm going to introduce to you um, Professor Lawrence Brown, LB. Um, and uh, LB has over 20 years of experience in corporate education, leadership development, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and executive coaching. He is currently the program director for our MBA program and assistant professor here at Elmhurst University. He is also currently pursuing his PhD in global leadership from the Indiana Institute of Technology. He is co-founder and co-host of a podcast called Cascading Leadership. He co-leads the Multicultural Leadership Program at ASE, the Hispanic Alliance for Career Enhancement. He is the CEO of We Coach Executives LLC as well. And tonight, he, along with Ingrid, are, is sharing their knowledge with us on the topic of ethical leadership and why it matters now. So I will turn it over to them. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I am uh, very excited to see some familiar faces. As um, Carrie had indicated, my name is Lawrence Brown, but I go by LB. And today I have with me Ingrid Wallace. And so I want to tell you a little bit about Ingrid before we get started. So Ingrid has worked for some of the most storied brands in the country and the world, actually. So Ford, GM, Disney, McDonald's. And I actually met her at Enterprise Rent-A-Car, where she trained more than 11,000 coaches and managers and leaders. And during that time, um, I was a, I've never been shy. Um, and I was pretty um, lock and load, right? I would say that I move with a purpose, someone that's very direct. And sometimes I didn't, over, didn't go over well in leadership. And by the fortune of meeting Ingrid, I went through one of her uh, training programs initially, and then I went through the second one, and then my career just absolutely accelerated because she helped me to learn and understand some of the soft skills that are necessary to be an effective leader. After I left Enterprise Rent-A-Car, I was thinking about embarking on different uh, career opportunities, and of course I remember Ingrid, and I hunted her down and found her. And I think she kind of, she says she remembers me, but I think she kind of remembered me because uh, I was one of 11,000 people, right? So I thought, you know, she may or may not. But by the time I had my conversation with her, the initial one, we became fast friends and I regard her as my Obi-Wan, so my, uh, my coach, uh, coach's coach. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Ingrid and tell her, tell, have her tell us a little bit about herself, anything that she would like to add, and then we'll get into the ethical leadership, why it matters now. Sure, thank you, LB. Can everyone hear me? I'm really excited to be here with you this evening. I, um, I've watched LB's career as it's turned to an academic wonder. It was a corporate wonder initially. And yes, I did remember LB. Who could forget LB? <laughs> um, and one of the reasons I remembered him is because his instincts were right on point all the time. Even though he didn't have the formal training at that time, he was a natural leader. And, and people followed him and listened to him. And that's one of the things I noticed in class. So as I was training leaders, um, I, I trained 11,000 leaders at Enterprise. And then I was called by McDonald's, who asked me to do some work for them. And I developed a program called the ITC Leadership Series, Individual, Team, and Corporate. And the individual um, session was um, leading with accountability and responsibility. How do you take responsibility for your actions? How do you take responsibility for producing results? That was the individual course. The team course was peer dynamics, which later became leadership dynamics, uh, which we, we do in, for many clients right now. And after we did the team one, McDonald said, well, how about an international one or a, a corporate one? And I said, well, the only thing I can think of is ethical leadership. It was, you know, it was very important to me um, that the leaders I had talked to, I mean, I had a laboratory of 11,000 leaders at one company, 20,000 leaders at another company uh, over the years, and I was, it was necessary, I thought, to talk about ethics. So I developed a course 
ethical leadership for McDonald's um, that we ran for about eight years. And LB asked me today, he said, what's your definition of ethical leadership? And I said, matching the highest intention with the highest behavior or actions for a positive and beneficial outcome. I'll say it again, matching the highest intention with the highest behavior or actions for a positive and beneficial outcome. And one of the, re one of the other reasons um, I came up with this idea, even prior to McDonald's, I was working with um, law enforcement. I was working with an, a law enforcement organization that was um, emergency medical, fire, and police. And these were the highest paid EMC people in the country. These law enforcement officers started at $80,000 a year 20 years ago. It was unheard of. <clears throat> and they were having problems. They were having problems because they were accused of profiling individuals. And at that time, it was a hot topic. In New Jersey, um, profiling had landed um, police departments in you know, in Senate hearings at the time. So they came to me and they said, Ingrid, we're not profiling. I said, oh yeah, prove it. And they said, well, um, we're not doing it. I said, well, tell you what, this is, this is how it's gonna work. I said, if you are not profiling, we'll find out. And one of the ways they wanted to prove that, they asked this police department to be the first ones ever to use cameras, ever. And they said, we don't want to wear cameras. I said, you have to wear cameras. Because if, in fact, you are not doing what they say you are doing, it will vindicate you. If you are, you have to cut it out. It's really very simple. So um, there, was, there was an officer who was very renowned for his training skills. He'd been on the force a long time. He was, he was very highly ranked in the department. And he had a photograph left on his desk. And this photograph was highly offensive racially, sexually, um, and it, it, it involved a corpse and drugs. That's all I'll say. But it had this officer smiling over this corpse. And this was a, this was a gag from students in his class who had given it to him. And it was on his desk. Someone took a picture of it and sent it to the Crime Commission. Can you imagine? And so they squelched it right away. And they said, Ingrid, what should we do? I said, throw the book at him. And they said, but he's such a nice guy. I said, yeah, but you're going to have to throw the book at him. You're going to have to do it. You're going to have to you know, put him through the paces. So they said, what would you do? And I said, well, I've got this course, Ethical Leadership. I've got this inventory that I'm working on, and I would like to um, <clears throat> put him through the ethical leadership battery that we've gotten and, and talk about how it works. And it's very simple. It matches your intentions on a scale. It matches your, be your behavior or actions on a scale. It matches that, the, the two of them, and it comes out with a rubric. And it's really simple. Uh, what if you had high intentions and low behavior? What's the short-term effect of that? So let's get them to that after we talk about a couple things, because okay. I want them to get a sense of, so you're, you, you mentioned uh, what's happened um, from the standpoint of a more um, micro perspective. Mm -hmm. But when you think about what we're seeing today uh, mm -hmm. on, a, on a more global level, mm -hmm. right? So for example, uh, so for those of you that are familiar with FTX, which is the, the Bitcoin, uh, the cryptocurrency mm -hmm. uh, company. Mm -hmm. Theranos, everyone familiar with Theranos? Right. Right, two, two really big ones are examples mm -hmm. of where ethical leadership went awry. Yes. Right, so tell us a little bit about um, you know, what, what you see and in fact why ethical leadership matters now. Okay, I was actually gonna get to that, sort of, kinda. Yep. Um, the fact is, I'll, and I'll say it, I'll, I'll just tell you the end really quickly. He had high intentions and low behavior. Because he thought that he was, you know, helping his, helping his buddies, you know, the students in his class. He was being, you know, congenial. But the actions, actually leaving that picture on his desk, you know, um, 
it ended up with a negative impact, which is short term, and a negative outcome, which is long term. Um, it got me to thinking, and it got a lot of people in corporations to thinking, um, how do we evaluate our own actions? And we're seeing with, you know, um, fair notes and, and with the Bitcoin industry, um, how what happens when a leader does not account for their own intentions. They're not accountable to anyone. Um, I was listening, I was at a funeral last week, and someone said, um, we evaluate others by their actions. We evaluate ourselves by our intentions. In the cases you're talking about, no one ever stressed the importance of those individuals evaluating themselves by their intentions. So why do you, why do you think though that, I would imagine that someone that amassed $700 million along the way and telling stories about basically, uh, so for Theranos, Mm -hmm. the the idea that you could detect all of these different diseases from a drop or a few drops of blood mm -hmm. the person um knew um elaine knew that she was unethical right mm -hmm. what, do, what do, why do you think that she may have may have pressed beyond that in, in terms of like how you correlate that to your model well i correlate something like um ethan Oates to my model I'm saying, here's a leader, because it's about leadership. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why I created the model. Here's a leader who was not honest. Here's a leader who intentionally misled people. And the actions that followed were not only her actions, they were actions of an, an entire corporation. And the people followed her blindly. It doesn't mean that all of those individuals were unethical. It doesn't mean that they were, their intentions were low. You know, many of them were very jubilant about being able to have this miracle cure mm -hmm. and, and being able to look at a drop of blood, you know, and, and being able to diagnose all of these things. Mm -hmm. But they were led to believe it. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I have some of my MBA students uh, here tonight. Thank you. And a few weeks ago, we actually had a chapter where we talked about ethics. And so they did a uh, ethical inventory. And what I found was interesting, and I shared with the class that there were there was a lot of gray area that people were in fact managing, ah. right? So, for example, it was something as small as is it ethical to take a pencil from work? Uh -huh. And where you would think the answer would be yes all the way across the board, <coughs> it wasn't necessarily yes all the way across the board. Yes. My students remember that, right? Mm -hmm. And so I find it interesting that sometimes where our moral compass begins, right, truly mm -hmm. is on an individual basis versus the, you know, the broader society. Absolutely. So in the minds of, of some folks, they say, well, yeah, I, I guess I, I could do that, or, or yes, I could do this. And it continues to grow, though. Like, where, where is that definitive place for the, for the ethical standard? And this is where I think you were mentioning that your model comes into play where someone has the opportunity to look at a framework mm -hmm and base what their decisions are off of that. Absolutely. Um, we have um, a small battery of questions where you look at your intentions mm -hmm. and you look at your behavior. And again, on a scale of one to 10 for each one, you match them. And some people come up with um, low intentions, high behavior, high intentions, low behavior. And the outcome, impact and outcome, short term and long term, are mapped out for that. Um, I just want to, and you had an interesting question in where does this start? Yeah. You know, where do we get the impetus um, to be honest, essentially, and look at our intentions? And um, I can go back to when I was, I must have been 10 years old, and there was a University of Chicago, I, look, I live in Hyde Park by the University of Chicago. There was a University of Chicago bookstore about a block from my house. I didn't go there every day, I loved it. And one day I went in and I got a bag of potato chips. And I was so excited, somebody said something, I ran out the door. I didn't realize I hadn't paid for them until I got out the door. I was so ashamed. I couldn't believe it. And it bothered me so much about six months later, I literally went in that store when nobody was looking. I took like a quarter, whatever it was, and I slid it across the counter. And I left. And that's, that was my impetus right there. Where did I learn that? You know, and it, and it shows up again and again and again. And if we have individuals where it's not showing up, how do we redirect them? Mm -hmm. 
when we have leaders that, that we are helping, how do we do redirect that impetus to do the right thing mm -hmm. um, and, and to make sure that their actions match high intentions? So here, here's a question that I was actually talking with a colleague earlier before coming over and I had made the, uh, I had made the point of, uh, we were discussing at, they were, the question was from one of my peers was, what, it, what is that you're going to be talking about from an ethical leadership standpoint? Mm -hmm. And uh, his, I said, well, we were going to talk about you and talk about your model and talk mm -hmm. about the whole idea around ethical leadership. Mm -hmm. But when over the summer as a PhD student, as Carrie had mentioned, um, I was in a course and we went back and forth around uh, the example was, I believe it was a company, uh, Lockheed Martin. And mm -hmm. Lockheed Martin is, is one of the is one of the uh, corporations that is known for their ethical mm -hmm. standard. Right. Yeah. Um, and I made the correlation that one of the things that I thought had a, had a part in that was the actual system where a lot of the leaders were former military, mm -hmm. where there's rank and file, there's order, there is a right. sense of a there's a sense of a code. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, but how do how do companies that are that don't necessarily have that and in, instill the idea of ethical leadership, ethical behavior mm -hmm. at the at the grassroots? Um, it's really interesting you say that because many times it comes from the leader, mm -hmm. it comes from the very top of the organization. You know, it really does. Um, I, I learned that working for the Walt Disney Company. You know, I learned that people were going around, they, all they wanted to do was please other people. And it sounds corny and it sounds ridiculous, but at the same time, there were people who wanted to do the best thing possible mm -hmm. for the organization because they thought the organization made people happy. Sure. You know, so I think that when we talk about at the, at the very base of the organization, the leader is going to help determine that. The mission statement is something, you've helped me um, develop mission statements in the past with many organizations. And I said the mission statement is who you are, what you do, and the spirit in which you do it. And if, if individuals understand that at the lowest level of the organization, many times if the mission is truly who you are, what you do, sorry, and the spirit in which you do it, mm -hmm. Um, you're going to find out that, in, that, that they are going to follow that mission. Mm -hmm. You know, I go back to when they talk about um, the space, first space missions, the Apollo space missions, put a man on the moon. Mm -hmm. You know, all they knew was they said there's a moon, man, man, moon, and they couldn't put it together. But when the mission put it together, all of a sudden, people who were, um, they said people who were doing the riveting, said, we're putting a man on the moon. You know, people on the assembly line said, we're putting a man on the moon. You know, I saw Walt Disney when they were winning um, Emmy Awards, you know, in the cafeteria, they were saying, we, you know, we won three Emmys. I said, no, you didn't. You're in the cafeteria. <laughs> or they said, you know, the person sweeping the street on Dopey Boulevard and, and Mickey Drive, right? They said, we won three Emmys. I said, no, you didn't. You're sweeping on the, you know, the drive. But they had that spirit. They knew um, that they had done something important to help that organization. Sure. Uh, we have a we have a number of uh, students that are that are here, and in class, I have mentioned to many of my students, particularly the ones that are coming right from undergraduate and they're mm -hmm. pursuing the MBA program. Many of them, I've shared with them they believe that they're stepping into the corporate world and it is going to be perfect. That oh, they're going really? to be, that they're going to, I wouldn't say necessarily perfect, but certainly the expectation that they're going to have leaders that are fully developed. They're going to have people that will be concerned about their careers. Mm -hmm. And as my MBA students have heard, that everything that I do in terms of coaching, training, developing students mm -hmm. is that I ask them literally to be selfish. Right. This is this is your opportunity to mm -hmm. develop and create your level of expertise that gets you the furthest. Right. Be intentional yeah. about what your 
MBA journey is going to be one to three years after you after you graduate, right? Literally tell people that, hey, I'm in grad school right now. I need to I need to focus. Mm -hmm. But one of the other aspects of it is is that making sure that they are clear and they understand that when they step into the workforce, that there is an opportunity for them, right? Because they have a better sense of clarity. What would you suggest as something um, new graduates, alumni can focus in on, on developing that true sense of uh, ethical leadership? Well, I would say, it's a great question, by the way. I would say that one of the misconceptions is that leaders are fully formed. You know, when you come out of graduate school and you, and you see a, a senior manager, uh, you know, somebody in the C-suite, they're fully formed. They don't need help. They are not, mm -hmm. by any stretch of the imagination. If they're any good, they're lifelong learners. You know, we see that in someone like yourself, you know, always wanting to learn more. Um, and as an executive coach and a C-suite coach, what I like most of all is I get to talk to people about their intentions. I get, I get to see the root of where they're coming from. I get to predict where they're going. I get to go with them there or help divert them someplace else. Okay, I have that, that honor, you know, to be able to do that. And when you get into the corporate world, you're going to be evaluating your leaders. It's okay to do that. You know, it's okay to question the people you work for. It's, it's okay to question their intentions, sometimes out loud. What do you mean by this? Why are you doing that? Um, I have a person who um, was a CEO for a $6 billion company. And she had a leader that followed her around the world. And she was gonna give a presentation. The night before they'd show up, at, the leader would show up at a cocktail party. Doesn't that sound supportive? Well, the intention was so the person could point out that that woman worked for him. Oh, by the way, you may think she's hot stuff. You know, CEO of a $6 billion company, but she actually works for me. So this same person, the same woman, um, I was having breakfast with her. She left that organization and came back to another one later. And I said, well, you know, what are you doing now? And she said, I'm global head of, you know, talent development, et cetera, et cetera, something incredible. And I said, how are you liking it? She said, I love it. I said, why do you love it so much? She said, because I have three brilliant women working for me. She said, and the hardest job I have every day is to come in and make sure I can implement their ideas. They have great ideas. My job is to make sure that they have what they need to implement those things. That's ethical. You know, and, and I'm so fortunate to have so many ethical models. Mm -hmm. um, people I work with, but I have just as many and, and probably um, exponentially more that are not. So you talked a little bit too about uh, the, the coaching that you've done. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't, I don't think I prepped you for this question, so here it goes. What would, you, what would you say has surprised you the most from an ethical standpoint and what has encouraged you the most? So what surprised, what surprised mm -hmm. you and what has encouraged you the most from a, this is something that you would want everyone to hear as a, mm -hmm. as a model for exec, uh, ethical leadership? Maybe it's me, but I think what surprises me and distresses me most is that people don't tell the truth. Mm -hmm. Leaders don't tell the truth. Heads of organizations don't tell the truth. Mm -hmm. What distresses me equally is that the people who work for them don't tell the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there's always an opportunity, there's a teaching and learning opportunity for every leader, especially at the head of an organization. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned Theranos and, and, the, and the Bitcoin folks. They did not tell the truth. Mm -hmm. That distresses me. Um, where I find hope is that now folks coming out of programs like yourself, yours, um, they question things. They question things, they demand to know why. Why is this happening? Why should I support you? And, and that demand comes with the ability to go someplace else. We always thought that people were stuck. You know, we thought employees were stuck where they are. Um, and I think you and I, LB and I have talked about writing a book called the, um, was it the 500 day tenure? <laughs> because people are leaving these organizations so quickly. Mm -hmm. So if I don't hear the truth or I don't hear something that rings true, most likely I have an opportunity someplace else. Mm -hmm. 
So this is a trick question for my MBA students. What are the two rules that I have if you work for me directly in my organizations? Who remembers? Make mistakes? What's the other one? Ask questions. Mm -hmm. You have to ask questions and you have to make mistakes, Challenge. right? If you are making mistakes, and I know that you're trying. If you're asking questions, I know that you're naturally curious. And those are elements that you have to free yourself to be able to do, right? Give yourself that freedom because someone else may not give that to you. And as I've said before, if people are not willing to answer the question, therein lies your answer, mm -hmm, right? Absolutely. And so you have, to, you have to make sure that there are these opportunities for you to maximize that, right? To be, to be aware of, of what's happening at all times, right? If you have, as we've, as we've talked uh, quite a bit, um, yeah, I, it's, just, it's just really important to make sure that you know where, to know where you stand. Um, another question around ethical leadership, and I'm, I'm leading the witness, um, is this quiet quitting that everyone's been talking about, right? This, this new thing of quiet quitting. Um, how does ethical leadership impact that? You know that irritates me, right? <laughs> That's why you asked me that question. I've been talking about quiet quitting for 25 years because it's not quiet quitting. Um, it, it's, it's much louder than it seems. Like if a tree falls in the forest, does it make a noise? Yes. <laughs> okay. And it's because I've always said, if you are not the kind of leader who supports your people, if you're not the kind of leader who is truthful and provides opportunity and empowers individuals, they will leave. Trick is they leave six months before they sign the separation papers. At least. At least, sometimes more. And when they have done this, it's sabotage, right? And when you don't do what you're supposed to do, when you're supposed to do it, it's sabotage, it's just slow. You might as well blow your desk up, but it's slow. You know, so quiet quitting is, is an old thing. Um, people have done it forever. Um, if the people don't treat their feet, treat it, feel they're treated well or fairly, they go here or here. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. Or here. Definitely here, yeah. especially if the values don't match. Mm -hmm. And that's again where ethical leadership comes in. If you feel that an organization's values do not match your own, it hurts your soul to be there. I mean, it is gripping. It, it doesn't feel right. It makes you ill, literally. You know, you feel it when you walk in the door. It has weight. You know, it has density and oppression when you walk in that door, when your values don't match. When, and when you do that to yourself, you're being unethical to yourself. So now let's come full circle and talk about uh, the Ingrid Wallace Presents Ethical Model. And um, when we, uh, when we have seen this at work, we see people um, encouraged, right? So tell us a little bit about, about the model again um, mm -hmm. and how folks can get to a, another level of ethical leadership. Mm -hmm. um, first, I say evaluate your own intentions. Mm -hmm. You know, as that speaker said at that funeral, we evaluate our own intentions. We don't ask ourselves, why are we doing this? If we have someone in our experience at work, for instance, who is working for us, reporting to us, and that person is not performing well, if that person um, is, is for a lack of, um, lack of a way to explain it, you know, if they've checked out, that person who is quiet quitting, as you say, mm -hmm. what, am, you know, what am I doing? What can I do differently? You know, how is my intention affecting this individual? You know, because some people come to work um, for the sole purpose of producing a result, and that's what it's supposed to be. However, in producing that result, we don't give people what they need, and they're not supported to do it. You know, so how can I, how can I evaluate what I'm doing as a leader? How can I look at my actions? The first thing you do is ask someone who can observe you you know, how to, you know, there's something that's not feeling right or seemingly right. This is what I'm doing. What is your opinion? You know, ask someone that you trust. You know, how do you, what is going on? What am I missing? 
and you have to have a sincere desire to change and we know how I feel about change you know change is, pos is possible unless there's a great deal of resistance so we have to look at the leaders and see how much resistance they have to change or else eth ethical leadership will never take place mm -hmm. you know especially if they have to raise those intentions and raise those actions some people just have terrible actions mm -hmm. <laughs> you know some people just do stupid and harmful and hurtful things mm -hmm. you know I, I think a lot of times, um, you know, one of the one of the observations in having, you know, managed um, high performing teams is that our messaging can also be unclear. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. when you say I need you to get it done, but you don't define what getting done is mm -hmm. right. You're you're pretty much leaving it open to each person's interpretation, mm -hmm. which is why you'll find that a lot of organizations will have like codes of ethics and, and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Mm -hmm to help there be a, a, a guiding light, a mantra of sort to, mm -hmm. to follow. And so that's why I like when you describe the way that you describe the, the mission statement, because the mission, mm -hmm. the vision are absolutely important and helps for individuals mm -hmm. to be able to see, you know, what is the, what is the guiding light for the organization? Mm -hmm. And hopefully you do align with, with the organization, the ethical behavior or, or the ethical standard of an, of an organization. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm thinking through like, for me in my careers, right, the different, the different careers that I've had. And I think everyone has had um, this idea of a code of ethics. But when I was talking to my colleague earlier, one of the things that I was saying is that I, the concern sometimes is, is that it's more, I'm doing it to reduce a litigious event <laughs> as, opposed, as opposed to it being the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to back up to something you said earlier. Um, when we're talking about people um, in organizations and, and why it's necessary looking at the mission of an organization, um, I am, as LB will tell you, I'm a performance management terror. <laughs> but it is couched in the fact that individuals need to know what's expected of them they need to know the criteria. And once they know the criteria and they're led to meet the criteria, then um, we can evaluate them fairly. I'll give you an example. Um, most times I ask folks, you know, why did you come to work today? And they say, I got, I got a mortgage, I got kids, they're in college, wrong. It's to produce a result. You have a covenant and agreement with your organization that you're gonna produce that result. How are we going to go about doing it? How are we going to go about making that happen as leaders? First of all, um, we're transparent. We tell individuals what it is we expect of them. We give them the opportunity to do that. We coach them when they're not quite making the mark, as LB says, make those mistakes. We have to coach them and get to them to the point where they do what we need for them to do. If you're not meeting goals, of your department, or if you're not meeting the goals of your manager, supervisor, division, the organization is not going to meet its goals. Mm -hmm. And there was something that you mentioned that I wanted to touch touch on when you were uh, asking for folks to to reach out um, from a, from a coaching standpoint. The technical term <coughs> is a 360 feedback, mm -hmm. and the the first time that I really heard 360 feedback was from you way back, at, you know, in the enterprise rent a car days. Mm -hmm. And what I found is that more organizations are actually doing it. So a 360 feedback is basically um, a survey of sorts that you will send out to people in an organization. And they can be, I, I prefer mine to, I want to know who it is. But of course, for people to feel more comfortable, um, you know, it's anonymous, right? So that, but for me, I, I like to know because I like feedback. I like people to be candid with me, right? One of the one of the challenges that I found is that Ingrid has helped me with over the years is that everybody else doesn't like candor, right? Because we're a society where we're teaching people how to be nice. But mm -hmm. the challenge with that is for me is that I need the feedback. I need what I, if, if it's broken, I need to know that it's broken. And if I broke it, I need to know that I broke it so that I know I know how to fix it. Right. Mm -hmm. Or I can ask, well, how do you how do you fix it? But if no one's telling you right then then you don't know and then it continues to happen so i like uh, candor and so 
not sure if I'm, I'm supposed to, but book plug, uh, Radical Candor by Kim Scott. My, I know my MBA students are laughing at me because every, every, every class I will give a, a book to read, but Radical Candor is a, is a, very, uh, a very good book to read uh, that, talks, that talks about this and how it can help you to develop. And I think that Candor, in my humble opinion, is an example of ethical leadership. You should let mm -hmm. people know where they stand. Absolutely. No question about about that. And I just want to put in a plug for my ERRC, my Executive Reading and Research Coach, SLB. <laughs> um, and what he does as an ERRC, he'll read 10 books all the time. And I'll say, which three, okay, which three do I need to read? He said, well, these are the best three. These are the ones that, that really are doing what you want. I don't have to read 10 books. I have an ERRC, Executive Reading and Research Coach. And That's I'm proud of myself thing. now because I have managed to get back on my reading schedule, even though I'm in a PhD program. So mm -hmm. we have to do these introductions. So yes, I do discussion boards, just like my students. And one of the first questions that you asked is one of the mo your most favorite things to do, and I say, I used to say reading until I started the PhD program because you're reading everything they tell you to read, <laughs> um, which this might be televised, right? Um, that's absolutely a great thing to do. I'm just kidding. Um, but I, what I was doing was, is, you know, being so focused on my PhD writing that it was, it, I felt like I was getting tunnel vision, so to speak. And one of the reasons that, in my opinion, that it's important to read is it helps to broaden your perspective and it helps you to stay abreast of, of what's going on. And so I try and read things that I know absolutely nothing about, right, to help, you know, trigger the brain and, and that sort of thing. I, I want to be mindful of time, and so, Ingrid, if it's okay with you, I'd like to open it up for any questions sure. that anyone may have. <coughs> Melanie, shocker. Hi, Melanie. She's my question asker. Love it. Hey, I have something that I'm, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Sure. Um, and um, I didn't have something that I'm uh, like to share. Can we talk about other Okay. Um, there uh, was a relative who um, worked on this and was on the work of the community. Um, she was going back to it. And um, her line supervisor felt that she was taking too long and he went into the bathroom and into the stall to ask her to Nothing happened. Um, and when things like that did happen, um, I was concerned that. Absolutely. In another situation, um, I personally worked on the very topic where, you know, entry level work on the very topic was 75 And um, one of the branch managers would not recall. Mm. Everyone was good. He was allowed to come in, go to the office, and then there was no work. Um, and a third situation, um, there was a the hospital. Okay. Um, first of all, the first incident is a legal issue, clearly. It's, you know, litigation is in order, first of all. Um, secondly, you know, why is someone allowed to be there? That's unethical. Remember when I said, if your values don't match the values of the organization, you know, it hurts your soul, you need to be someplace else. And I know I say that, and it's hard to get another job, I, I know that, but it's harder to live with some things like that. It really is. Um, I'll tell you, I, I'll give you another example. A friend of mine is, is a pro bono lawyer for a huge firm in San Francisco, and they do pro bono work for people in Mississippi. 
And one of the cases was a man, a black man who worked in the shipyards. Um, and it was the son, I believe, of Trent Lott. Or Trent Lott owned the shipyard. And the manager there, the supervisor, in order to discipline employees, all the employees in the shipyard were African American. And in order to discipline them, they called them into the office, shut the door, and hanging behind the supervisor was a noose. They turn around, take the noose off the wall, place it over the head of the person who was being disciplined. And in one instance, this was an issue because in this instance, the person um, had a breakdown, had evidently seen their, one of their parents noosed, hung, and they had a breakdown. And that was what triggered um, the, the litigation. And I thought it was kind of crazy, but in this day and age, this was only about 10 years ago. And look it up, nooses in the workplace. You look it up today, and you'll see cases from last year, year before. You know, so Melanie, it, it, it is pretty ugly out there. In many cases, we have so many instances that that person will probably be fired at some point, but the person that they are persecuting goes first. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times I see that. Yeah, I, I would say too that um, this, is, this is why the foundation of ethical leadership is so important. People will always be able to justify the reasoning behind why, why they did what they did, right? Mm -hmm. there, there, there could be backstory behind the relationships, which is normally the case in those situations where individuals are, are trying to protect or trying to preserve for whatever reason mm -hmm. and not necessarily concerned about what the what the outcome is on the other side mm -hmm. and as a result um, there's also the thought process around well I'll, I'll address that you know I'll cross that bridge when, when I get to it um, there is a there's a one of my favorite quotes by Caroline Wong is who you are is who you are if you can't be who you are where you are you change where you are and not who you are. Mm -hmm. And that's Absolutely. one of the, that's a dynamic where, yes, uh, and Ingrid actually uh, shared this story with me many years ago when I was uh, working somewhere. And, uh, and I actually share this now when I'm, when I'm actually coaching. I use the term, if the, if the house is not coming down on you, do what is necessary to, to maintain your job, you know, do your best and all of that. But at the same time, you should be preparing to make the logical move in your career so that you're able to, to move, uh, so that you're able to, to get to that next opportunity. And this is where oftentimes having either a coach or a mentor comes into play that can help guide you down, guide you down that path. It's, it's one of the things that, that I think you all have heard me say that is most exciting about what I do as a professor and as the director of the MBA program is that I get to actually help people and move to the next level of success, right? That's extremely exciting. But you all have also heard me say that uh, be clear about what your intentions are so that you know, because a lot of times we don't have a sense of, of direction and it may, it may delay what we know is the decision that we need to make. Mm -hmm. So the broader question is, is that when is it time for you to move, to move on from those, from those mm -hmm. situations? So that just because those are three terrible mm -hmm. examples. Yeah, and, and the definition, when it's time to go, when you've lost the support of the people you work for and the per support of the systems around you. The systems are not working in the instances that you're talking about. Policies, procedures, and practices are out of whack. You know, so it's time to go. Make no mistake about it. But thank you for bringing that up, Melanie. Any other questions? David, did you have a question? Yeah. The new thing? Yeah. It's when people were hung for, black people were, for, were hung for what were supposed to have been crimes and they were not. And so this practice was brought into the workplace and people recognize the noose for what it stands for. So if something is going on at work and the supervisor doesn't like it, 
the supervisor would bring out the noose because they would know it would frighten that person to death. And then they put the noose around their neck so they could get them to obey. And that was wrong, illegal, and very unethical. But thank you for asking that question. Oh, so we have one here, here, and here. Yes. Okay. It's a, that's, a, that's a great question. Sure um, is. I would say one is, is that if you're, are you familiar with Glassdoor? So Glassdoor.com is a, is, a, um, is a platform that evaluates uh, organizations. And I would say that's a, that's a great first start. Uh, secondly, I would say that um, if you are not on LinkedIn yet, um, join LinkedIn. And one of the things that I have that I have done, uh, and I use I, I'm a power user on LinkedIn. Like I love LinkedIn. I use it for I use it for research more than anything else. But particularly, like for example, if you were to if you were to connect with me on LinkedIn and you start going through and you see a company that you're interested in, let's say it's um, Coca Cola, for example, right? And you see that we're that we're linked together, then you would reach out to me and say, Hey, I, I see that you're working at Coca Cola. Would you have some time to chat about that? And you'd be surprised how many people are willing to do that, mm -hmm. especially if, if it's someone that knows someone, right? So in a network, um, you may not know everyone, but you may know someone that knows someone. And so that's mm -hmm. why the network is so important. But I, I, I think it is, it is extremely important to do that, to do that homework. Um, ask people uh, that may be in that same industry that work for a different company. Now, it could be that one company will talk about another company, Generally, I found that that's not necessarily the case. And so it also, by asking another individual within an mm -hmm. industry, you may find that that company may be a better fit once you've had the conversation with them. Mm -hmm. But Glassdoor, I would say probably, and uh, Glassdoor and LinkedIn would be the two you know, starting points 
And to plug the WCPE, that's a good place to start too as well uh, here on campus where they can uh, help you with any intel that they may have already. So intel, intel, intel all day long that gives you the opportunity to be able to have advanced information. Mm -hmm. Great question. Yeah, and if yep. I can chime in on that. Um, what's your name? I'm sorry. Claudia. Claudia. Um, it's a two-way street. Never hesitate to interview the company. Absolutely. You know, you are going to spend your time, you're going to spend probably a third of your life there. You know, for however many years you're going to be there. You know, a third of a day. You know, so consequently, you have the right to know what they stand for. You know, you can ask them, you know, how do you, how do you go about evaluating people? You know, what, what does, how does this company support um, people? How does it support its people? What kind of programs do you have to develop folks? You know, um, what kind of charitable offerings do you have? You know, these are the kinds of things that get at your values, as I was talking about earlier. And you can learn a lot about a company's ethics that way as well. And this is one of the this is one of the challenges that oftentimes folks that are that are younger, uh, more junior in their career are. I never know what what question to ask in the interview. Those are the sorts of questions that you ask, and you will actually impress the people that that are interviewing you. Mm -hmm. And if they're not impressed, again, it's a it's a sign, right? So ask those ask those questions. But those those are great points. Mm -hmm. Luke, you're welcome. That's a great question. Um, first of all, how are you communicating it? You know, there, there's a way to ask everything. Um, you know, when I give feedback to people, I talk about, you know, I statements, for instance. When I see this going on, um, this is the consequence. This is the way it makes me feel, and, and this is what I need to know. Um, I think that the way we couch our questions are, it's very important. Um, we have to find out, you know, sometimes you, you want to do as much in writing as you want. You don't want to be accusatory, but you certainly want to know what's going on um, and how it and, and be very verbal about how it affects you. You know, um, I tell people when we use I statements, LB knows we talk about this a lot. Um, for instance, very simple, somebody's coming in late and it's affecting the work, you know, your workstation. Um, when I see, you never use the word you. When I see people coming in late, you know, it affects everyone, you know, in the office. Um, it makes, it's, it's frustrating. So from now on, what can we do to make sure that everyone's here on time? See what I mean? Yeah, it, it really works. And there's the other thing, LB knows I like the appreciation needs exercise. You know, if you want to give someone feedback about something, this is what I appreciate about you. People always want to hear you that you appreciate something about them because nobody ever appreciates you, right? You know, and so consequently you start with someone's name. Um, you know, this is what I appreciate about you. You know, I appreciate the way you communicate openly. And what I need from you, that's the second part of the equation, not but, and what I need from you is to listen to me more. You hit that, you get the message there? Or if someone doesn't speak up enough, if you don't speak up enough, um, I appreciate the really quiet and efficient and effective way you go about doing your job. And what I need from you is to hear from you more. See that? The first person you didn't have to tell to shut up, <laughs> and the second person um, you said you needed to hear them say something when they're not saying anything. So you have to you have to learn how to couch these things in communication, but you have to communicate. Yeah, I, I would add that if, it, if it's something that you think is potentially um, that may, um, that could have potential aggressive outcome, right? I think the, the first thing that I think about is that I ask the question, right? Or if I hear something that is inappropriate, mm -hmm. I will say, really, why, why would you say that? Or, or how would you, where, exactly. where would you, where would you, mm -hmm. How do you evaluate that? You know, mm -hmm. ask asking the question in, in, in an inquisitive way as opposed mm -hmm. to an accusatory way right. is is really is really important. Um, the other thing is is that 
you know that the whole phrase see something say something mm -hmm. is you have the opportunity to enlist someone else that is there so hopefully if there is someone else there that eye contact alone may be helpful in defusing a situation mm -hmm. right because what you'll find is that people um it, it may sound really bizarre, but people sometimes legitimately may not realize that that's the way they're coming off if no one has ever told them right. why candor is important, right? Mm -hmm. Because they literally, if no one's ever told them, because maybe that person is is mm -hmm. more on the you know the aggressive side, and so folks are like, well, I'm not mm -hmm. going to tell her, I'm not mm -hmm. going to tell them, I'm not going to tell they. You, you you just right, but when but when we are mindful, right, which is which is extremely important to be, then you you. Can, you can manage it more, you can manage it more effectively. Mm -hmm. And again, everything that we're sharing, is, it's not like a magic wand. It's not like it's, the, it's, the, no. it's, a, it's a golden, you know, a golden opportunity mm -hmm. that's just gonna you know, click and happen. You also have to practice it too, right? To, to get to that it's point of, of, of proficiency. So when I started off, I mean, first of all, which everyone laughs when I say this, but I, I am a raging introvert. So outside, yeah. of, outside, of this, outside of this realm, most of my time is in my books, on the computer, mm -hmm very often and, and to myself that's how that's how I recharge me too but believe me when it's time for me to be on stage I'm on stage mm -hmm. but it will it will absolutely drain me I was just in Canada for a week and I I, I don't know where what I'm running on right now <laughs> but hit the wall it's working but the, yeah the wall I'm gonna hit that wall in, mm -hmm. in a little bit so yeah absolutely any other Thanks questions So I would say that with what, what you're describing, some of the elements, um, there is a department in most every company called human resources. <laughs> and and that, that sounds like an opportunity where you're going to employ human resources because um, probably something that we did not discuss is, is that every conversation is not necessarily for every individual and sometimes it's important to employ human resources so that they can help give you the foundation and the, and the, um, the basic um, what you can and can't do, what you can and can't say, it's very, it's very important to employ them as, as a part of being able to guide yourself through mm -hmm. that. Because you wanna also make sure that even if you have the best intentions, your intentions don't necessarily, they may not resonate with the person that you're actually talking to. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and you brought up something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that that was just brought up is attitude. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I always say attitude is the way one expresses the way they are, whatever they are thinking, feeling, or experiencing. That's what attitude is. A positive attitude, in my opinion, means that energy is flowing in the direction of producing a positive result. 
a negative attitude means energy is flowing in the direction of, in the opposite direction of producing a positive result. That's why somebody with a negative attitude can walk into a room and suck up all the energy. You ever notice that? It's gone. And if you're a leader and you have people um, that are doing that, it's a performance issue. People don't realize this is a performance issue. If you are doing this, if you are taking the energy that it needs to get the job done, and you're changing it to where people cannot get the job done, there's somewhere on that performance review, because you know the criteria by now. There's somewhere in that performance review where it can be indicated. One hopes. One hopes. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, well, Ingrid, thank you very much. We are at time. And I want to thank you all for, for coming out. Uh, I am absolutely humbled by the number of people that, that came out. I also thought we'd maybe have like four or five. So thank you so much I'm for so being here. I'm so happy to be here with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah.